in Price too, we just feel really lucky this evening that you're here. Um, it feels remarkable to be sitting with you. It, mm -hmm. it genuinely does. Um, we came across Judith's work about two years ago, say, and Kate, my colleague, wrote a blog about it at the time, or maybe about a year and a half ago, which you might have seen. And the work that you do just inspires us. So um, we never thought we'd actually meet. And then we heard that you were coming to Ireland and things just fell into place. So it's a bit of magic. Well, there's a lot of magic because I had a psychic reading that said that I lived in Ireland in another life. Wow. So I, I, and the fact that the only beer I ever drank was Killian's Red and the only alcohol I ever had was, Rich, what? Chardonnay, not No, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 Bailey's Irish cream. Bailey's, and isn't that unusual? So I figured all these strange woo-woo things might be true. So you're home, actually, that I'm you're home. home. I'm home. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Judith is, and I looked down at my notes, an organizational anthropologist. Um, she's a pioneer of change. She's an extraordinary, I mean, it's, 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 I shouldn't be talking about you in the third person as you're sitting here beside me, but, you know, a best, she's written seven books, seven business books, all best-selling. And the one that we're talking about, I suppose, most this evening is conversational intelligence. Mm -hmm. And for all of our guests, there's a copy of the book. Please take it as a gift on your way out. It's, you know, we won't, we'll, we'll barely, you know, touch the surface of it this evening. So it's a fabulous read. Um, Judith is, uh, I don't know, in, in terms of like, well, this year alone, you're, um, you have been uh, cited as one of the top 15 coaches globally. Um, one of the top, is it 10 thought leaders um, in terms of leadership globally? Um, one uh, the top 100 consultants. You have served as an adjunct professor at Wharton, visiting guest speaker at Harvard, MIT, Kellogg, and it, the list goes on and on. So. It is really wonderful that you're here with us. So, um, I think, you know, as I said, we, um, your work and conversational intelligence is something that very much speaks to how we work in Priced and how we try and work with each other. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought we might start if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you, you know, who you are, where you came from, and what brought you into this work? My parents used to say, another planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, I think we want to focus a little bit on how did conversational intelligence get birthed based on what I've done. And Lovely. How, how, Thank you. <clears throat> so it turns out that um, I grew up in a family that was very unusual. My mother, the only thing I knew about her was that she, in the cold days that she had to wear three dresses to keep herself warm. Imagine that's all. I knew about my mother and her growing up. Um, my father, I knew very little, except that the, there were four boys who ended up being dentists and doctors and really great thinkers. Um, but I didn't know the things that most kids learn from their parents. I was told what to do a lot. I noticed that. So at an early age, I started to notice patterns. I noticed that my dad was a teller. I noticed that my mother got very quiet. So I became an observer of human behavior at a very young age. And then I found in my basement, a um, hidden away, a book that had uh, things from the newspaper. And I was maybe eight, nine, 10 at the most. And I found stories about my father, things that I never knew. Um, he had a twin sister who passed away. Um, he was valedictorian of his class. He was an actor. And he did all sorts of things that were quite wonderful, but he never shared that. I never knew that about him. I just knew he was a dentist. And I confronted him in a way, saying, you've got to tell me more about this. And here's where I learned the story that was my life-changing story and why I do this work. I found out that my father was a stutterer. And he stuttered at a young age, at age five, when my grandmother said to him, um, I only wanted girls. And he had a twin sister who had water on the brain who only lived till she was five and a half. And your job is to push her in the carriage. So imagine a young little boy not being connected very much with either of his parents, learning that this was his job in the world. And he became a stutterer after that. He was what I call an emotional orphan. And I'm gonna take a sidebar for a second to say that conversational intelligence I've learned, because I wrote a dictionary for Random House also with 3,500 business terms. If we don't have a word for something, 
it's hard to talk about that thing, mm. right? We don't, so we either talk around it or we label it or give it other names because we don't have the word to explain that. And so I realized that something had to happen in the world that I could put words to the feelings I was having, that my father was having, so he didn't become a stutter. Couldn't, wasn't there a way that he could talk through that? And that as an early aha for me, that language has to help us talk through these beyond the seven uh, universal emotions that we feel, like fear and hate and love. And by the way, the love side is very minimal compared to the negative side in emotions. There were a lot of other emotions that we live by. And what if there was a way to stimulate discussion around the world to help us find words for the things that bring us together yes. rather than push us apart? Does mm. that make sense? It does. It does. So the last part of that story is that my dad stuttered all the way through school. And when he was in high school, he had a teacher that wanted to make him the lead in the play. She saw right the, what's, what's it called? Um, something speech? The King's speech. King's speech, speech right. Yeah. She yeah. saw right into his heart and knew how talented he was and he needed a voice. And she said, I'm gonna help you take a lead in the play. And he said, I can't talk. And they went through all of that. And when he stepped into that role, a new identity space in his brain, and I'm saying it that way because I, my study of neuroscience has explained that this is how it works, that your brain can open up new spaces, that the networks, energetic networks, are designed for that. And when he stepped in that role, his stuttering went away. And that's how he became the valedictorian of his class and the head of debating team. And by the way, he became a dentist. Looking down in people's mouth made him feel good. <laughs> um, but beyond that, he went to the government and said, I want to bring dentistry around the world. He was selected to be an ambassador from the United States. He learned uh, seven languages, self-taught, because as a stutterer, he used his hearing so well that he could go to bed at night, listen to the, the, the words about how to learn this language, and then we'd wake up in the morning. And his memory was extraordinary. And so he learned seven languages, and he went to 21 countries and dragged the kids, us, to Mexico and an international camp and Peru and places like that. So we were part of that. We got to see, which is why I'm so comfortable internationally, mm -hmm. and wanted to look for the things in common that no matter where you were, whether it's Ireland or the UK or Africa, I wanted to find the things that answered the questions of what could have been different for my dad so he wasn't an emotional orphan. We, su we suffered as kids. I mean, he was a teller. That was, and when he went too much into interaction, he started to stutter again. So he held his, his identity and with integrity. And this became the bed of all of the research that I've done. I, that, that is very powerful. So then when you talk about conversational intelligence, you talk about the... Um, you know, the fact that I, I, we, we use, what, between 10, 16,000 words a day, there are 7 billion of us on the planet, how many billion conversations are happening at any one time? Mm -hmm. And yet you're saying that with, if we use that intelligence correctly, that this is something that we can actually use to shape our brains and in, that can even affect our physiology. Can you talk tell a little us about bit? That, First of all, in my research, which is uh, well over 35 years, working with companies, a lot of large companies and medium sized wanting to grow, and um, nine out of 10 conversations fail to hit the mark. That's what. Nine out of 10. Nine out of 10. Yes, that in the conversation, people quickly go to listening to confirm what they know because it feels good when you think you know what the other person knows quickly. How many of you have yeah. felt that way, right? Then you know if you can confirm this, then you can go from this to this and you get to the next stage. The intention is good, getting to higher levels of whatever you need to do, but we quickly go to a lot of confirming. And yes. that's often where we miss the mark because we've invented words like double clicking. So now in conversational intelligence, there are five essentials. One, the most popular one is double clicking, which means that don't assume that when you think you know what the other person means that it really is that. And double click a little bit, fish around if you will, and ask some questions for which you don't have answers. So I'm giving you all the essentials. The <laughs> listening to connect, not to judge or reject. Um, you can understand why these are important now, double clicking so that we get a little bit deeper with people rather than assuming, oh, click, click, we're on the same page. That's when you go to meetings, everybody thinks they're on the same page, they quickly go walk out of the meeting and later they find out three weeks later they all felt like they were in a different meeting. Because you, you have an example of that where you talk about even people working with the word success 
yeah. and then and describe how that double click works if you were to do an exercise on yeah it. so this this is such an easy exercise to do and it astounded me the first time I did it I was working with Bob Lutz who was with Exide and then became the vice chairman of um, GM so he, very high level guy and he, he let me experiment we had 250 of his people in the room and I said, let's see how much we all have in, you all have in common. You've been working together. You have great goals we're going to talk about for two days. And I said, put the word success in the middle of a circle and put 12 spokes around it. And then just say what success means to you. So everybody did it at the table. And uh, so we had 250 people and seven or so at each table. And then I said, so um, why don't the first thing you do is I made it up that moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, weeks, weeks of research and thought went into it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's, I like that. <laughs> you reframe that beautifully. <laughs> That's another essential, by the way, reframing. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm going to drop these in, and, uh, and you see how common they are to everyday life, but we often don't do them. And um, so I said, match at your table how many you have in common, and we're going to give an award to the table that has the most in common. So everybody quickly you know, start to match and match and match. And then I went around and said, OK, so who had a lot of things in common? And none of the hands went up. Well, what's the highest thing you had in common? Like, you know, and I got the tables to speak up and they were getting very shy because it turned out they only had, out of all those people, one table, one word in common for the word success, which they had been using in this company to help stimulate a whole other level of growth. Yet nobody knew what success was. Yeah. If you think about that for a minute, how many times we're using the most common words with each other, assuming that we know what they mean. And then all of a sudden, we start to find problems showing up. And as a diagnostician and a scientist, I said, nobody taught me that. Mm. And, I, mm. and this re it, it requires more research. Absolutely. So that part where we can often leave a meeting or leave a conversation with somebody, and then you know, a day or two later, we have another conversation, which we think is based on the first one, but then we realize that we're both in a different space. It's Completely. And what do you do to overcome that? If, or is that just too simplistic a question? How, how, many, do, you how many, do you want five things, three things, two things? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit yeah. about when you talk about how conversations can affect us physically mm -hmm. and, um, and also can even reshape the way reshape our brains almost. Right. So the, the, the thing I had to do is find out what causes some people to be success, really successful and what causes some people not to be successful. In fact, as I'm using my hands, I'm thinking most of what we have people look at is if you go to the right, that's where certain success is. So I've literally patterned all the work that we've created so that um, when you're co-creating, which is the highest level of connecting with people, it's not collaborating. Collaborating in the dictionary is cohorting with the enemy, just in case we all didn't have that as the primary thinking, right? It's not. It's being cautious about other people and hoping that you'll get to a place where you collaborate is the word that is supposed to trigger better behavior. Yes. Right? And it's known that all over the world, I found out. And so I said we need new words for that. Yeah. And so co-creating. So far on the right is co-creating, being a resistor because there's an I and a we, and we have what's called a dashboard, a conversational dashboard, and it looks at the behaviors from resistor to skeptic, wait and see, experimenter, and co-creator. And I'll tell you the story about where that came from, because it's amazing. Um, so we have those five places to go, and the right side are the green things. We code them green, and on the left side, we code them red. Red connects to the lower brain. It's the reptilian brain or the primitive brain. So those are the feelings of fear, is it? Or I, yes. I, okay. Yeah. So we get our lower brain is here to protect us. In fact, the primitive brain, it's it's fight. It gives us the ability to have fight, flight, freeze, appease. It's how we handle a moment. But it doesn't give us the emotions clearly, and it mm -hmm. doesn't give us the interpretation of those emotions. It doesn't give us the behaviors that have to be created in order to prevent them. It's just that reaction. And when people are in a meeting and someone promises to support you in a very difficult conversation, um, and then all of a sudden they decide to change their mind because of all the other things that go on at that moment, now you've put them into a place of distrust. And instantly that part of the brain gets activated. And cortisol spews like paint in your brain. And as it spray paints your brain, it closes down the most important part necessary for the kind of thinking that we want to take place in companies. 
And this is called the prefrontal cortex. And trust lives here and distrust lived there. Mm -hmm. Work done by Angelica Demoke at uh, Temple University and 102 other scientists located trust in this part of the brain and distrust in that part of the brain. And does that make sense? It absolutely does. And I'm just thinking that, you know, you can quite often be triggered without realizing it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you can start to feel uneasy at a meeting or in a conversation and not quite be, be quite sure why, but it, it can be that then, that it's that part that it has almost happened without you being aware. That quickly, in 0 0.07 seconds, your body is so sensitive to connecting or disconnecting, being loved or hated, trusted or distrusted. There's a very numerical way that the brain works. It's, it's an algorithm and it's on or off on those two switches. And they're operating at every moment of the time. And so if we feel, if, if I'm sitting with you and all of a sudden I go like this, as subtle as just turning my body and not going back to you or going like this every once in a while, what are you reading? Right? So rejection I, and exclusion. And it, will ha it could happen in that quick second. And then the more we, it's not resolved in that moment, the more the cortisol goes up and starts to empower the, or disempower the parts of our brain. This part of our brain is beautiful. It's now called the executive brain. Mm -hmm. used to be part of the neocortex, which is up here, more the intellectual, what you know, don't know kind of things. And <clears throat> it turns out that this has wisdom. Wisdom can, where you can sit like a judge on and, and top of difficult situations, but have the sensibility, regardless of who you are, when this is open strongly, it, then we become, we can honor uh, each other in different ways because it's a very we-centric part of the brain. Mm. So wisdom, integrity, being able to have strategic thinking, uh, empathy slash compassion, and we can talk about the difference between the two of them. Um, so uh, foresight. Literally being able to have foresight. There's all this is living here. So what do you do if you find that you're in a situation or, or working in an organization um, where there's there there's a sense of competition, there's a sense of maybe a, a sense of stress within yeah. work. Then mm -hmm. presumably you have that kind of fear at some level on a maybe on a semi-continuous basis mm -hmm. or yep. what, how can you overcome it how can you be the leader in that space then to try and develop trust or to start that um, there's a way that I coach leaders about that situation and then there's another way that I might talk about it so if you want to hear it from the coaching side I can talk to you about how I help leaders who are in companies like that, because there's so many companies yes. with silos yeah. and yes. um, things going on where people aren't getting along. And the first thing is they'll find the person that's the difficult one and that's causing all of this, and they'll say, let's fire them. You know, I'll, we'll have HR come in and give it a shot and see what we can do and see if we can make it better, and then if it doesn't work, we'll just we'll get rid of them and we'll find somebody else to come in. Mm. And I've been in companies where they start, I mean, it's like a rolling cart. You put the next bad one on the cart and the next bad one, right? Yes. What I found in my studies is that a lot of times some of the people that are the disruptors are now what we call disruptive innovators. But we never thought about them that way because mm -hmm. we're working to create we-centric companies where everybody thinks alike. And I was saying, as I was going through my work, that's not the end game that I think is the healthiest end game. If we give up and give in, and we all come together, but we really don't believe it, and we try to be quiet, we've lost our voice, and then what's going to happen? How do we change? How do we grow? How do we... Oh, when lights change, something is happening. <laughs> I think that's... Whenever that... I'm telling you, this is very funny. I have my little um, phone next to me when I do webinars. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my phone will start to record what I'm saying. So I think when energy shifts, something important something. is happening. Okay. That's how I think. Isn't Want that amazing? To? Some people should put me into the hospital because they didn't. <laughs> If you were, I mean, you have some great examples of where this, because in, in one way, the theory can, it can make perfect sense in theory. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that, you know, it, better things come when we trust one another. Better things come out of conversations where there is um, a desire of both people to come together and create something better. But yet, you know, Tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, you head into a meeting at work. There's, you know, there's everybody is the same. They haven't heard uh, the talk. So, um, how do you actually move from, 
you know, to actually take that step forward and start to generate trust and start to behave differently or have a different type of conversation? So <clears throat> one of the things I introduce is the concept of space. So in companies, we have to think about space just like we think about people and behavior and things like that. Because um, if, the, if we have limited, if our environment feels limited where I can't bring my voice in and so they make me be quiet, um, I'm limiting space physically, yes. emotionally, and catalytically. My brain is not going to operate. If I'm being told to be quiet and not to bring up certain ideas because the boss isn't going to like it, I'm going to lose my voice and I'm not going to make the space big enough to have big ideas put on the table. So that's a new dimension for leaders to think about. How much space do you give in the room for people to have different divergent points of view? And if you were the leader in that case, what would you do to, to allow people to have that space? So um, uh, there are a lot of different rituals that we've created that people can do to create the space. I mean, I know there's a, Amazon has a company called Create Space. So <laughs> I wasn't the first one to, to, to bring that into the world, yeah. but, but it's, it is a big important word in the world right now because the sense of space, if I am in a meeting. Do you mean physical space? Psychological psych and physical, and it okay. feels physical. That's what, when, if you create the right rules of engagement for a meeting to take place, and then people feel that they can breathe because one of the words that I use, in companies too often people talk about expectations when the word should be aspirations. The difference is expectations come with uh, uh, reward and punishment. If we meet our expectations, you're going to get a higher bonus, um, where aspirations are a whole different cosmic thinking in There's the brain. More potential. Huh? It's, it's it, about potential. It's about what do you aspire? Aspire means to breathe. And when human beings talk about their dreams together, they aspire together, and they actually open up different parts of the brain, especially if it's non-judgmental conversations. This is hugely important. So a lot of the work we do with leaders is to help them notice when they're becoming highly judgmental because instantly the brain retreats to cortisol. So what rituals could a leader start so, to use? So we have a beginning and an ending ritual that leaders can do. And I found out that FedEx, everybody does, does these, which is so exciting. Yes. That and had you brought that to them? Um, I did a, a meeting with 800 of them, of the top people in the company, and then it spread and it's spread very quickly because it's so easy. So um, doing rules of engagement when you start out in a meeting is really important because people come in with other meetings in their head, other yeah. conflicts in their head, other things going on. And so there, our heads are filled with things that we want to think about. And we go into a meeting and we usually get distracted. And every 12 to 18 seconds, our brain goes in anyway to process what we just heard because you can't take in some of these meetings all in one hour you know, and remember everything, so you have to process and process. And so you want to get people's brains to be on the same page as easy as you can. So rules of engagement, or whatever you call it, how we're going to be together at the meeting, you make up the right, because rules can sound harsh. Um, and we talk about what would make this a great conversational environment. And so people, all, there's some typical friendly words that show up. Let's, let's all trust each other. Let's go in and decide we're going to focus on trust. Or let's listen. Let's ask more questions. Those are some, and I'm sure, what else would you say are some? Well, yeah, those with, you know, the listening typical. with respect right. and things yeah, like and that. Allowing people to speak without interruption and things right. like that. Right. Yeah. So we, when we hear those words, we know that they're the top line thinking, mm -hmm. and they're often commonplace. They often have multiple meanings, and that's why double clicking is so important. So we never do. And we've had people say, well, I used the rules of engagement, and it didn't work. And I said, describe to me how you did it. And they just captured very quickly trust, you know, yes. whatever all those things are. And you have to break through that, because there's a lot of social right behavior in some of these meetings. And people don't tell what's on their mind, and they don't share what they should. And, and it's because you really have to make those rules become uh, where people can take bigger risks. So if you hear things that are different, like, Let's, let's be risk-taking with each other this time. Let's be transparent with each other this time and really say what's on our minds. Let's bring up the difficult issues, the conflicts. Let's not save them for the bathroom. Let's <laughs> put them in the room. And, and so we double-click. And, and even if somebody says, let's respect each other, and a facilitator or a coach would say, or a leader would say, what do you mean by respect? What would that look like if we were doing it this time? Yes. So it's not just a word. A word, when you think about it, words are just 
squiggly lines that we've put meaning to. Right? Yes. And you have to and, and it's different not, minds can ascribe different meanings. Always. Okay. That's why that success exercise blew me away. When a room of 250 people, not one table, they only had one word in common. So that's when I start to diagnose. There's a, more, a different need in the world around conversations to get closer to the heart of what a conversation really means to people. Not just the head, but the heart, where we're struggling with what are the ways to describe the feelings we have. We have to make it easier to do that. Mm. And not just assign quick labels. It's easy, so just, in that rule of engagement, you would, you would spend time really double clicking on what do we mean by respect, what do we mean, mean by listening and... And then you think, well, you know, if somebody goes into a meeting at nine o'clock tomorrow morning and they have a long agenda and there's, you know, how... Do five people... minutes. You can do it okay. in five minutes. Yeah, you can do it in five minutes unless you want to play with them and do it longer okay. and make that the, the meeting. But you can, you just... How would you do it in five minutes? In five minutes? Mm. Yeah, you'd, go, you'd do double click, clicking okay. pretty quickly. You get one or two things and as soon as you see something that you know is at a high level, You'd say, tell me what that means. Let's go a little deeper on this. And use the words, let's go deeper. So that you're, you are instructing, the person in front of the room is instructing people where to go in their brain. Yes. Going deeper is something that we all know, and so we start to do it. And it's like what, another level of influence that is subtle and powerful. Mm -hmm. We don't yell and scream. I have a thing where um, I, I use the word nudging. I start to bring nudging into the world with leaders because um, we don't want to be told what to do, but we can be nudged to try something. And so words like being an experimenter, a mentor of an experiment, that's how we spell it, yes. with a capital M. And when we get leaders to experiment, all of a sudden, um, they don't have to commit to anything. Yeah. All they have to do is try it. Let's talk about what happens afterwards, see what, see what results you get. So I get everybody to be scientists in companies. It's great. It's great, because then there's no sense of failure. No. They're only, you're testing. You're just and... doing an experiment. Yeah. If you don't like that one, pick another one. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so then it starts to become fun. And even having a conversation like that about what the, the way we're going to be together, um, that's a very different type of conversation to the first item on the agenda. So yeah. you've already switched people's thinking and their way of being. Completely. Yeah. And people then, and, and you also say, and what happens if we don't agree to our rules of engagement? I love that question. And what, how would you like us to, you know, do you want to raise your hand? There's one, one leader who put a bowl in the middle of the table and had people put money in. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know, like a, a tool for using bad that's, language. That's right. Yeah, that's well, right. Yeah. yeah, you can have all sorts of fun things. But I, I've seen breakthroughs in just giving people that um, new way to look at a meeting. I've seen breakthroughs in a whole team come from that. Whole team. If one of the things is transparent, let's be more transparent with each other. In one particular meeting, I had done 20 interviews of the people that were coming before the meeting, so I knew where the problem was. There happened to be one person who was very strong, and everybody liked his contribution, brought in a lot of money to the company, but was not a good player, and took a, his ego was in the way, and all sorts of things. Just by setting up the rules of engagement and giving people a chance to be more transparent, he chose to talk about himself, and he had never brought that up before. It was always somebody else who wasn't good enough, and he was the hero, and you know all those kinds of things. And somehow there was space for him just by setting the rules. Transparent, um, everybody is right because your contributions are important. Kind of reframing a lot of things mm -hmm. that people were afraid of doing in the meeting, and it completely changed the conversation. And I can see how that gives the space that you were talking about. That's it creates the space. a whole different space. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, you, you have done so much work with companies where, you know, it has, you've, you have very tangible results. So you know what it's like to, you know, face into tough meetings, have difficult conversations and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, I mean, over when we were having something to eat, you were talking about um, Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a bit about that? Because that's so, that's very radical and very now. Very now, and yeah. right. And very much the kind of work that I'm excited about doing because I wanted to put my arms around big projects. And big projects used to be big companies, like 40 billion and that kind of thing, and 100 billion. But I wanted it in the world globally bigger. And I, I wished, so I believe that if you kind of think about it long enough, it's gonna come. Does that make sense? Is that too woo-woo for this group? No? <laughs> I'll go with that one. So, somehow, <laughs> our brains are zeroed to find the things that we need to find. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I got a call from um, a woman, a PhD, 
who was in a project in Delaware, the government. And there were 10,000 government employees who were working um, with Wilmington, Delaware, which had 300,000 people, citizens. And they called up and said, could you entertain doing a project like this with us? We would like to bring conversational intelligence to Wilmington. And, and what, 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 was their, what was their sense of purpose in that? What did they, where did they see it taking them? Or um, did they even? They yeah. felt that the government had become too top down and that the leaders had lost, as a result, the, the government leaders had lost a little bit of their sensitivity to human beings. Because once we start to get top down, we also we stop practicing some of the sensitive skills because these work so well yes. that we give up these. And so we don't notice the little look on a person's face anymore. And mm -hmm. we don't um, give kindness at a level or caring because that's not hard. And that may not get money if I'm too nice. You know, we have all these beliefs that go with that. Yes. And fortunately, they had they brought in a um, couple of PhDs. This woman was from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, with two others to work with the head of this group, and um, they wanted to use this as their experiment to see what they could do. So, has so, it started? Oh, it did start. Wow. Yes, it did start. We had the meeting, and uh, the first meeting with the top 28 people. And their responsibility was to absorb this work, um, experiment with it, and to uh, do some assessments with me and with them, a starting place about how they saw trust and all sorts of things, and then um, start to digest it more and more and more. And um, they last week had their big meeting about how they're doing. And, um, and then they were going to take it deeper. So they had to become teachers. All of them had to learn how to bring this work into every level. So they would bring it to the next level, and the next level, and the next level would help. And they'd all start to use the language, because a lot of it is shifting language. And when you shift and bring new words into a culture, you start to change perception of what people look for. So what were you actually doing with that 28? What did I do? Yeah. I spent a day talking about the uh, core um, elements to what conversational intelligence is case study sharing stories of working with people like Alan Mulally, who was the CEO of Ford, that when Ford was in um, $17 billion in debt, he transformed Ford. And we talked about his style of leadership. And so different case studies like that are the worst uh, leader I ever worked with. And, and Tell us about and that one. That one? Perhaps, yeah. Because <laughs> we won't know anybody like yeah, that. I'm sure so. you wouldn't. I'm sure yeah. you, I'm sh absolutely sure you wouldn't. Um, so, there were two worst. So I'm going to give you the, the quick and easy ones so you could see how conversational intelligence can be used in such simple and elegant ways. And you don't have to learn complex, all sorts of things. Um, so let's start with the, the simple first. Um, Verizon called me. Do you have Verizon here? Yeah. Um, and they uh, said, we want you to come in and, and talk to an executive um, and see if the right person, the right match. There were 13 of us that he couldn't, every time he interviewed oh, you one. you were going in as a coach to to, meet. to, uh, to work yes, with him, yeah. Yes. And there were, there were 13, every time he interviewed with one, he didn't like him, he said, I want another one, I want another one. And I never had, I never had someone interview 13 before. No. And I was the 13th. <laughs> and um, we were all briefed about what his reason for needing coaches. And so we all came in with a certain perspective. And a lot of people use the word problem. A lot of the coaches said, I'd be glad to work with you on the problem. As soon as he heard problem, it was like, I don't have a problem. And I didn't know that this was what was going on in the back room, background. And then when I interviewed with him, I, I, he said, so how would you approach this? And he said, truthfully, I don't have enough information to know even what to say this is. I said, I would love to partner with you on finding out what's going on so we can uncover it together. And my gut just talked that way. And he, I was neutral now. In fact, I was on his side. And so he picked me, which was, which was great. And um, I also noticed that he felt very strongly about what he was doing. He is a best practice leader in his mind. This is the kind of person he is, right? So when you're a best practice leader, you push people, right? You want to get them to the highest level so that everybody can achieve together. These are his words. I'm speaking his words now. And so I decided I wanted to do what we call pull behavior rather than push. I could quickly go in and ask some questions and say, I'm going to do this, or ask some questions I'm going to say. No, this man needed, his ego needed a lot of pulling where he got a chance to talk about his strategies. And that's what we spent weeks doing. And um, I didn't go in with 
strategy yet. I just listened. And I heard beautiful things. I mean, he, because they, they were doing some international things, at Thanksgiving, he had his whole team on the telephone to speak to a European client, because that's when the European client wanted to speak. Isn't that amazing that he got his team to do that? At Thanksgiving? At Thanksgiving, right. But that was taking them from their family. Exactly, but he didn't care. Okay. Because they were doing what the boss wanted, the CEO wanted them to do, and he was thrilled that they did that. And they showed up and, right, yes. so his ego needed to go in a certain direction. Okay. And he wasn't observing that- The impact. The health impact by far was unbelievable. And when one of his employees ended up in the hospital and said, I'll give up my 25 year pension to not have to work with this guy again. And when he said that, then the four other people that reported to him spoke up and it turned out that they were close to wanting to leave the company also, but everybody was hiding it because he was a best practice leader. And when you're best practice and you're going for the best, everybody wants to be the best. And so you give up something and they were giving up their health and all sorts of things. So. I spent a lot of time listening, 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 and listening to where there might be a place that I could go in with him and share some things to experiment with. And it, he, he wanted to talk a lot. He was so excited that he would do reports for the CEO and he would red mark the report so that his people knew how to make it better. Now imagine getting a report 14 times from your boss. How many of you have gotten red marked before in school? You know what that <laughs> means, right? Bad job, bad job, bad job, right? So, I mean, that's what, it, but he didn't have any so awareness. How, did, you, how ha did he change? So what I said to him was, um, why don't we do something a little different? Are you willing to do an experiment with, and now having spoken about everything that he believed in, yes, he was very ready. And I said before, but let's, the word is priming. So let's prime the meeting before you get together the next meeting with your team. I'd like you to find out what they want to put on the agenda. He said, no, I want to put on what I need them to do. And I said, yes, and. I'd like you to see this time, this is our experiment together, find out what they want to put on, and so he did. And then I said, when you get into the meeting, um, see if there's anything else that they ha had that came up that they wanted to do, and he added more things. And I said, what I'd like you to do is continue to ask, because you put telling aside, just ask. So I made it so simple. These are called interaction dynamics, and in the brain, they operate differently. They open up different things, so when you're telling a certain part of your brain, opens up, and when you're asking, another part of your brain opens up. And one produces more curiosity, the asking, and one is telling people what to do. It's very specific, action-oriented, what to do. And so he had been telling people what to do and were diminishing their energetic commitment and help that they could bring their ideas and everything into the situation. So um, he, did, he, he did the polling behavior at the meeting, and, and I asked him, how did it go? And he said, it was fine. I said, anything different? He said, oh, it just felt like a really good meeting. He has no awareness whatsoever of what people might be feeling at that point. And this is after you know a long time of, anyway, so that night, strangely enough, four people called me on the phone after hours to say something about the boss. And the first person said, he said, what did you give my boss to drink? <laughs> so that's how different, noticed. that's how different they said it was radical. Now, he didn't notice radical at all because he wasn't calibrating in that zone. Okay. He was calibrating in the telling zone. The more you tell, the better you're going to get people to do what you want them to do. That was his image. So that was one of the most revolutionary transformations in a short amount of time. Yes. And he ended up reading the books like Who Stole My Cheese? That was out at the yeah. time and <laughs> all those other things. He's continued to be one of their best leaders. So one of the... I mean, it sounds like the basis of that was the trust that he had with you, that you and he had got to a point of trust so mm -hmm. that he was then willing to try something that you were suggesting, which he wouldn't have naturally found. Right. I mean, trust, how does, how does that work in terms of this area? If we are leaders, if we are coaches, if we are parents, if we don't have trust, then the growth part of the brain, this part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, and heart connection, by the way, they work very well together. It doesn't open up enough. It becomes stagnant. It shrinks. Yet, we keep thinking that feeding information, which is the neocortex up here, is what we need to do. We go to school, we get fed more, we get A's, then we dopamine highs, we want to produce more good answers and so forth. We have not been opening up this part of the brain. You can't open this up without trust. 
So if you think that you're teaching kids how to be, to think, if you're a teacher teaching, or a leader think, helping your people to think, if you don't have trust, this part of the brain is closed, and we're re uh, moving chairs on a, the deck of a Titanic. So what, I mean, there's a sense, uh, I know obviously in coaching uh, any of the work that we do, it has to, you know, we have to have that foundation of trust. But, you know, it often feels that trust in, in an organization is easy to lose. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to gain. Um, how, what, how, what do you recommend in that area? You know, if I want to, I want to gain the trust of my people. What about so I worked with Angela Arntz, who was previously the CEO of Burberry for 20 years. We've maybe even 22 now. So I've worked with her through her transition to become yeah. who she is. And she's, from the very beginning, I knew she was special. Um, we worked at Donna Karen together, and Donna once said to me, out of my 13 presidents, who do you think is going to be the star? And I said, Angela, and she said, Angela? I would have never picked Angela. <laughs> I said, why? She said, because we're in the fashion world, and you need to be, have that feel for fashion. And Angela was what she calls herself 50-50. As in? As in 50, you know, analytical and 50. Uh, yeah, 50 <laughs> right. Fashion. yeah. Right. And... Um, and so she made trust the primary first thing that everybody who comes into a company that she works with has to pass that trust test. And so the interview, when you, and I was there with her in, in England when she was interviewing people, and she told me how many people she interviewed and how many people made it. Because if someone understands what it means to trust, then they bring that sensitivity in. And she says, it's, it's like I, I, I trust, I breathe, I trust. That's how important it is. So how does she... How does she do that? Yeah. Yeah. So she's extremely transparent. We have five words that um, are in my book for people who are getting the book that help leaders know what they need to do to literally change a brain in a short amount of time. As keeping it there in trust is harder work than opening and starting yes. it. So yes. the first is being transparent. When I did the meeting with her top 125 people at Burberry with her, we started by having leaders tell stories about them, and not when they were heroes, but when they had bumps in the road and they had things that they had to accomplish and they weren't perfect and they were learning like all the people in the room. Yes. So they were identifying by telling those that with the people in the room, but they were also showing transparency that it's okay not to be perfect. I mean, there are a million data points that come out of being transparent with people. Hmm. That's vulnerability, I suppose, as well. Complete vulnerability. And yeah. when we do that, our hearts connect. We have a sensitivity now. We realize these people are, I could go to them and talk about anything because look what they just talked about. So there are a thousand data points that come out of just doing that one action mm. that change how people relate to each other. Mm. And it works better to do that than to say, now these are the 10 things that you have to do when you come into a room. Not that, I mean, yeah. the, the yeah. setting rules of engagement isn't good, but a lot of times we say, we create books, handbooks about what you can and can't do. Showing up as a trusted person who can open up and be transparent has a thousand times more impact when we see it in action. And each one of those five leaders did, were transparent. Mm -hmm. And so they were demonstrating the behaviors that they wanted all of the leaders to have at Burberry. And then the other four were there? Re yeah. re put relationship before task. How often do we go into a meeting and we, we don't do that? Even the rules of engagement are about relationship. How are we gonna relate to each other? Yes. What will help us do that better? So relationship before task. Um, understanding, you, is understanding. But it doesn't mean understanding what I said and confirming what I said. It's standing under the same reality. Ah. A complete different shift. What do I need to learn about you that enables me to know your world? What kind of questions can I ask? Not questions that I have the answer for, but things about you that I don't know so that I can stand under your reality and see the picture of your world. That is a chemical shift in our body that opens up the prefrontal cortex heart connection. And if you've done the transparency and relationship and then you get to this part, you've transformed a, a connection with that person. And that is, that part when you said about um, asking a question that you don't know the answer to, that can often be hard for a leader who sometimes feels that they always need to know the answer. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a new behavior. If I'm genuinely asking a question, with other people sitting around who might be judging that I do not know the answer to, so I don't know where it's going to go. That takes courage. Um, at least 60 to 80% of the leaders that I've coached were 
people that came in, talked to the board. The board said, oh, you're so smart. You have so many new things that, that we want you to introduce into the company. So they go ahead and do that. They took the instructions from the board. Why shouldn't they do that? And those are the ones that I end up coaching three months later, six months later, because people say, I don't want to work with that person. They don't care about my ideas. <laughs> yes, yeah, they're just right? telling. They're telling. Yeah. And one woman, I had to interview 28 people because she was looking for somebody that would say how good she was. She couldn't believe that she had blown it. Yeah. They gave her one of the most important jobs in the company, and she had already you know, fallen because of so that. So she wasn't doing that understanding piece, standing not, under. And not at all, not yeah. at all. Um, so pull in the beginning is, is advice for good leaders who are coming into a new company, is learn have people show up, tell you their perspectives, understand they're standing under the reality. Yeah. G or U S. S. Shared success. Ah. Again, too often, if, if a CEO or somebody at a high level of position, a new CEO comes in, they, have, they were brought in because they have a vision for the company. So they go and begin to bring it in and push it in, sometimes mm -hmm. too much. Jacques Nasser um, came to Ford. He was the first person outside of the Ford family. I'm using a couple of Ford examples today, but they tie together. Yeah. And um, uh, so he said he had phenomenal vision for the company. The board loved it. So he did a road show, and he went around and told everybody what the vision was. And people were so thrilled to have him. He just felt like the right energy. He came back three months later to see what everybody was doing, how they were bringing the vision to life. And it wasn't happening. And he started to get frustrated, and he said, what's going on here? I mean, you know the vision. We've talked about it enough now. And, and, and they ended up, the board said, it's, you know, you're out. And they loved him in the beginning. It's, you know, it, yes. it's that, that yes, it assumption that when I come in, I tell. They know the vision. Now you, it's your job to put it into place and to figure it out. And it takes a lot more than that, yeah. as we know. So when right? you say shared success, what he was doing was, it's my story. I'm you sharing my, my success. Way. Right. Yeah. I'm going to share my success, not shared success, yeah. building it yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. So and then the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Truth telling. Uh. When you see a gap between what I think and you think, my reality <laughs> and your reality, bring it up. It's OK. Make it OK. A lot of times people think, uh oh, here we go. We're going to fight. You think this. I think this. Let's get positional. I'm going to tell you mine. You're going to tell me yours. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to fall out. And that's what the pattern is that we have in our mind. And my job is to disrupt those patterns when I work with leaders. Yeah. So that's not the pattern, the only pattern. That's level two conversations. It's positional, right? It's being addicted. It can lead to being addicted to being right. Um, and and it's, it's a form of persuasion and influence that when I was studying influence, it was the top. If you could learn how to persuade others then you were doing, you were amazing. You were yes. like the best of the best. Yeah. And I remember the day I sat in, in a program and I said, there's gotta be another word for that because that's not the best. There's, you're not utilizing human beings' capacity, their brightness, their new thinking. You know, we're now standing behind the, the person who's the strongest or the rightest and that's old fashioned. And so that's when co-creation became yes. the third level of conversational intelligence, and boy, are we learning things now from neuroscientists about how level three conversations, co-creating conversations, are completely different. They literally connect the energy, if this is again on that woo-woo side, connect the energy <laughs> the field, go, yeah. but, but, it's, but it's, pr it's proven, you yes. see it. Yes. Yeah, where people's mirror, mirror neurons, that's something in the prefrontal cortex, they start to connect. I start to pick up and sense how you think, I'm standing under your reality and uh, our heartbeats start to go in this similar rhythm. So now I'm in amazing place of trust with you. Mm -hmm. My brain opens up. We start to think, like how many times when you're in that state, you say, God, I was just thinking that. You are, because somehow, whatever that energy of thinking is within 10 feet, it maximizes. And, and then you have two minds working on something Working on together. Than, yes. And picking up little pieces that the other person didn't see. This is how the brain works. Yeah. And all of a sudden, ideas pop up that you know are brilliant. That how could they have thought that, right? It's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've had conversations like that, and not not nearly enough of them. But when they happen, they do feel a bit like magic. It's like, yeah. wow, oh, that ended where'd that come from? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And by the way, if um, when you whenever you see your client, uh, a colleague, or anybody, there's a, a way the eyes look when they're kind of having an aha. And we can, when we start to notice when that happens, 
ask the person, what were you thinking? And they say, what do you mean? And you'll say, no, what, what just happened? An idea flies by like a, a little bird. And if you catch it and put words to it, it may not come back again, just the way the brain works. But if you catch it, I've had, I had a, uh, did a talk at NASA, this woman at lunchtime, I saw that look in her eye, and I stopped her and said, what just happened? She said, what do you mean? And I said, oh, I saw something in your eyes. She said, I'll talk about it later. And she went down and wrote down what I said, write it down then, right, and tell me. She said, that was a life-changing moment where a flash came into her brain, she was comfortable, the meeting was good, things started to open up for her. And it defined her relationship with her daughter that had not made sense to her for most of her daughter's life. And everything healed after that. <laughs> so in that safe space, something came up. But you're saying if you, if somebody doesn't almost catch it as it goes by, that we can sometimes lose that. Oh, we do. How many yeah. times do you yeah, get yeah. those? You yeah. say, that was such a cool idea. I'm going to remember that one. You don't write yeah. it down. I have a little red book that I carry with me now. Because I know as soon as I turn my head and look in somebody's eyes, I'm going to catch their eyes. I'm going to want to talk to them. And I will completely lose that energetic yeah. Field. Yeah, yeah. So we all need those notebooks. Um, I, I'm conscious now of time and wanting to open it up to others. Um, but if I, with just the question that I would like to ask you, um, just to finish this part of it, is what is occupying your thoughts and your work now? Where, because you know, the book is of a couple of years ago. Your work is so present and of now. But there's something else that is that you're working with now. So would you be comfortable to share that with us? Um, are you asking, speaking about my medical situation? I am speaking, yeah, and coming at it in a roundabout way so that it's up to you really yes. whether you wish to no, share that, it No, thank not. you for being um, <laughs> sensitive and it's okay. So um, a couple of things medically. First of all, on September 11th, 2001, do you all remember where you were? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was in the doctor's office being diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, found out that I had a pretty serious case, even though it was a small, I found the lump myself. And um, I got it taken care of, so that, that was years ago. However, um, this year, uh, I mean, 2015, July, um, I found another lump and went in and had a double mastectomy. And that worked out fine, except I didn't heal. And I felt pain under, here under my, in my rib cage, and it turned out that I was harvesting uh, pancreatic cancer, which is the worst cancer you could have. Um, somewhere between one and 7%, not even 7% anymore, people die from uh, pancreatic cancer. And I had a tumor that was this big, five centimeters, wrapped around the top of my pancreas so that it was inoperable. It, it was where all the veins and arteries and things like that go into your heart. And, um, when I found out that, I found out in, in a room with my children, uh, friends were in the hospital with me when I was being diagnosed, and uh, they said, could you ask your friends to leave? And the doctor said, um, I said, so what's happening? And he said, um, you have pancreatic cancer. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, it means that you have two weeks, two months, or two years to live. That's it. And I looked at my children, and I could, my son, I mean, I know my children. I know what each of them is thinking. And, um, so that was, July, what was the date? It was uh, the end of December 2015. Yeah, 2015. And so uh, five days later, I went into New York City to find the doctor that was going to take care of me. And he got me on chemo pretty quickly. And um, I'm here. Yes, you are. And we're at the end, yeah. we're heading into the end of uh, the second year. Yeah. What's been fascinating for me is because of the work I do, Beside having a great doctor who gave me the right uh, mixture, and it was an alchemy for me, uh, he said he'd never seen chemo markers drop so quickly in any one of his patients ever. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, you were very responsive to the chemistry that he put together. That was his one thing. But simultaneously to that, I was launching a program in 75 countries around the world with thousands of coaches. And we, the person that was doing this with me, uh, Ben Croft from WBEX, um, when he found out on December 24th, uh, almost he didn't eat for two days because he had just invested money in the, uh, the armature, the network that was going to make this happen. And he talked to all his friends saying, oh my god, what did I just do? Should we get a lawyer in here to write a contract that says that they'll, if she dies, <laughs> 
he'll get his money back. I mean, that's how we were all thinking. We were very rational about it. Yeah. And uh, on the 18th of January, we launched our first session. And I decided to share this with everybody in the program. And uh, everybody responded beyond the, what I would have ever imagined because I was told that people in all these countries started to do prayers for me. And they showed me pictures and sent things of candles and so forth. But what was even better is our conversations. They stayed, with, we all stayed with the belief that I was gonna live. Yes. And what did I need? So I even had someone who came in from Korea, Dr. Um, Park, who did some type of reading and said, she came, what she gave me was the best advice in the world. Speak to your pancreas, speak to your stomach, um, speak to you, your liver, give them a name, and say, what are you here to teach me? And so I shifted from, I'm gonna die like everybody else to, and I never thought that, by the way, um, to what am I here to learn? So I learned that breasts are for nurturing, and I was not um, nurturing myself. That's what Dr. Park said. You're not doing these things for yourself. You're doing so much for other people. Take care of yourself a little bit. Have them help you. Yes. Yeah, and then, so nurturing, nourishing is here. I wasn't eating well at all. I was always eating bad food. So I learned to talk to my body, and that's what I found out, that I had to change my food. I had to change my um, connection to people, let them into my life a little bit more. And now I have something in my lungs, lungs, so the pancreatic cancer in my pancreas is gone. And in my lungs, I have little things that are going down and shrinking in size. Um, and they're in close to the normal zone. And then we're gonna sustain it because I'm doing all these other things. So that was, that's aspiration. Yes. And that's the core of the work we do, to aspire is to breathe. And so I have to learn how to expand my vision, have people help me do it, yes. not try to do it alone. And all of that came from this experience. That's so. amazing. And <laughs> um, and, and I'm sorry, I should have said at the beginning, this is uh, Richard. Um, uh, Richard Laser here, uh, <laughs> who answers we, those Richard questions. I, we had three dates and got married 47 years ago. <laughs> yeah, three dates, that's it. I knew right away. Someone is trying to call me on my, oh, my agent, Alison Kirpin. Oh my God. Sorry, can't talk now. I'm busy. <laughs> um, that was amazing what you just shared. Oh, and thank, thank you so you. much. I'm just learning yeah. how to share it. Yeah. I haven't um, done it too much, but learning. Mm. And that conversation piece mm -hmm. around, yeah, you feel that the that sense of having very real conversations, and you talked about some of the work that you and Richard have done together mm -hmm. in terms of understanding it and how that honesty and trust can help with the disease. Um, that honesty and trust and being open and to live what I teach, be transparent. Yeah. Put relationships, and I mean, all of those things I have to practice. You know, the shoemaker without shoes, is that what they call it? You know, we've all fallen to those habits. I have to live this work. And when I do, magical things happen, things happen. I mean, I sit down on the plane and the right person is sitting next to me. And, you know, because yes. your energy fields, our energy fields, become purer in some way. I don't, and I guess that's what I'm looking forward to. Neuroscientists are intersecting with quantum physicists. That's how I learned more about the space that we create, the new spaces we create in the brain. And so their conversations I'm studying. Um, I have a TV program that we're starting um, that will, I'll be going around the world and interviewing people that have insight about how these things intersect around conversations so that we get great, great brains, interdisciplinary brains working together and more of that is happening in the world. Why did you just take an, a deep breath? Oh, because I just think it's so powerful and has such potential, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it feels very right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah, yeah. it's co-creating with each other across disciplines. Yeah. We don't speak different languages. Mm -hmm. In what ways are our languages in common? And what research have we done that intersects and helps us see the world, see our brain, see humanity, see everything in a new way? It's the new way. It's that reframing, refocusing, redirecting that frees our brain up from being stuck in. I'm addicted to being right. We've train people to be that way. Yes. Now we have to inspire them to be a different way. It was an amazing evening. Thank you very much, Judy. You're welcome. Thank you.